It don't matter what I try I just can't win and I don't know why There's a fork in every road I pick the wrong one and then I go American loser, yes I am Disenfranchised from everything well, I fall up and I fall down An American loser the day I was born Hello and welcome back to another episode of American Loser. This is uh, the second episode in our uh, Halloween series. We are live, as always, from where, Dad? Where? Where else would we be on a Sunday morning but Eatontown, New Jersey? Exactly, the shared universe shared studio. Universe. Mike and Ming taking great care of us, as always. The big kahuna behind the ones and twos. Who else? Hey, what's up, guys? He was looking rough this morning, was he not? I, hey, don't be mean. <laughs> but uh, very special guest here uh, joining us again. So uh, a recurring guest on the show, my good buddy Anthony Cianci, has actually brought his father, who the two of them were guests for the Barbary Pirates episode. So I'm very excited to have uh, the Cianci boys. Not not solving <laughs> mysteries today, but uh, the Cianci boys in studio. Uh, Mr. Bill Cianci and uh, my, my good friend, one of my oldest buddies from high school, Anthony Cianci, joins the show again. Welcome back, fellas. Good, Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having us. Can we admit how funny it was that, because uh, me and my father got here uh, early, and uh, the door was open, thankfully, and uh, there was almost a Benny Hill-type moment. If you look at the security footage, looking at the door to the bathroom to the studio that we all just kind of <laughs> at no time we're all four of us in the same hallway yeah, that's right. that we we're all constantly rotating in and out of the bathroom and then hilariously enough kahuna walks in the elevator door the bing hits the little ring right and kahuna it, we're all to the right of him immediately to the right and kahuna doesn't even look just hooks a left and goes What's up? And just walks right into the <laughs> Directly into the into uh, So do right now... Go, do not collect $200. Yeah. Do that bathroom thing. is currently writing its congressman. So it is what it is. Um, so what we're doing is we're doing a couple extra episodes here this month. I want to uh, get into the spirit of Halloween, finally, if we can. Uh, very excited here. we got some cool shit we're going to cover today. So this is the second episode uh, in what's going to be, uh, I think, four total cahoons. Ooh. we got a couple extra ones, uh, some bonus content here for our bonus regular content. listeners. Bonus content, wow. And uh, this is going to be, um, unfortunately, this will be uh, Larry's last episode just for a couple of episodes here, because you're going, you're abandoning yeah, the family, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. We're yeah. taking it on the road. You've had enough. So <laughs> That's it. You and my beautiful mother going, going on off his to, tour. Yeah. Pennsylvania, right? Yeah, all the way to the far reaches of uh, Pennsylvania. All right, cool. But you're taking the RV out one last time, you know, for yeah, the summer. That, that'll here, so. be it for the for the 2019 season. The fall, as it were. And, yeah, uh, there you go. And Mr. C, I know you're you're no longer hanging out down the Jersey Shore. I so, am not. So it is what it's it is. Buttoned up. Yes, it is. Done for on that one, man. Now I'm excited to bring you on for the show because we had um, one night over at Anthony's house where, let's say, uh, we were having a couple of adult beverages, um, and uh, we started talking about this one particular topic. Okay. Now, when you start having drinks at uh, Anthony's house, Kahuna, there's a rule. Okay. Um, you're not allowed to call out of work at his house. You have to wait until the next morning. <laughs> That's okay. right, right. Yeah. That's no calling right. it quits. And you yeah. have to drink enough to ensure that that happens. <laughs> so, I like this rule. <laughs> it's problematic here, but we're very excited to talk about this week's loser. We're going to dive right in on him here because we got a ton of good... It's actually... His life's baffling. It makes no sense. Is that fair to say, Mr. C? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, uh, we've covered some admirable losers on the show, some downright awful human beings, some terrible ideas, and uh, plenty more to come. We are not running out of content for this no. show. No. I've no. noticed with One that, thing. like, there's always losers. There will always be losers, well, and there will never not be losers. In order to birth a winner, one must also birth a loser. So, oh. that's, uh, yeah, which is, that, that's what my parents said. That's why they got two kids. I feel like that's the tagline <laughs> right. for Joe Dirt. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, however, we have uh, never, and The Rock means never, talked about someone that everybody loves quite like today's loser. This guy's beloved, okay? Um, and how old were you when you found out about this guy? How old was I? Uh, we haven't said his name yet, so we're going to save the name for the reveal. But okay. How, how old were you when you found out about the... Young. The, everybody, I think, is young when they find out about him. Yeah, and it's always around this time of year we talk about him, because Halloween holds a very special significance for this guy. Um he gets associated with America, but uh, he was born in Budapest, Hungary, uh, March 24th, 1874. And his name was uh, Eric Weiss. It's not a good stage name, is it? <laughs> no. No, no, no. No. Eric uh, Weiss. Later, Harry Weiss, 
Uh, and then uh, no. Finally, becoming one of the most famous men in the entire world after assuming the stage name. You want to guess it, Kahuna? Harry Houdini? Hell yeah, baby. What the fuck? What, what <laughs> it is, is happening? <laughs> it is wow. a beautiful thing when you see that look come over yeah, Kahuna's face. Right, right. He's magic. That's what yeah. I'm talking about. <laughs> right. It's like, I might have this one. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, keep going. Don't you ruin this for me, okay? <laughs> I don't get many good guesses. No, that was solid, brother. So uh, without further ado, this week's American Loser is going to be uh, Mr. Eric Weiss, okay? Weiss is born to a uh, Jewish family in Budapest, and... Um, you know, there, there's a rumor that um, I'm sure you guys have heard this that uh, Jewish people run show business. <laughs> yeah, there, so, there is an influence. Yes, yes. So they're very good at that. Uh, and Houdini is um, he's a big, big part of it, as we're going to show. He creates his own kind of empire in the entertainment business. But uh, the family emigrates from uh, Budapest, which is Hungary. But when he's born there, it's Austria Hungary. So there's this whole weird thing of who does Houdini belong to? I think he belongs to the world yeah. when you really think about it. He's that cool of a guy, mm. man. So. But uh, the family emigrates to the U.S. when uh, Eric, that's what they're calling him, Eric. Uh, I can't do a Jewish accent. Can somebody do one? Uh, you, no, you're no. Own, that's not happening. You're on your yeah, own there. No, you're on your own there. Uh, we, we don't want to be sued for libel. Um, <laughs> so Eric was just four years old. Uh, and uh, when his family comes to America, his father became the rabbi of a prominent Jewish congregation in Appleton, Wisconsin. Mr. C, are there any famous burgers out in Appleton, Wisconsin we should know about? Sollies. So <laughs> <laughs> Solly's Butter Burgers. For, for those Original. who don't know, Mr. C is a, uh, a burger connoisseur. Uh, Bill Cianti's Burger Reviews, still online. Check him out. Yes, sir. Right? Now, uh, it's weird because we're going to cover, uh, we get into seances here later, and there is nothing, there's no tongue twister quite like Cianti seances, Cianti seances. <laughs> so, oh, God. It's going to get awkward here as we go. But um, they're out in Appleton, Wisconsin, and uh, Vice, who would become Houdini, later claims that Appleton was his hometown. So in Appleton, Wisconsin, where he was born, is still known as Houdini Square. Well, he wasn't born in Appleton, but no, as but a four-year-old, where he, where he, he moved, says, "Yeah, right, he calls right. that his hometown." But he called that his hometown, mm -hmm. right? So there's a whole weird thing. So, and then also back where he was born in Budapest, they also have a little Houdini area as well. There's Houdini museums all across it. Again, this guy he's belonged so, to the right, world, he's man. Such a great guy that everybody wants a little little piece of Harry Houdini. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty see, cool, man. I feel like see, it's almost a competition too to see who has the most collection of old Harry. Houdini memorabilia. There's a couple of museums that claim to have the most. There's some stuff there, man. What yeah. were you going to say, No, I'm just like, I'm confused. Harry Houdini, American loser, something doesn't click here. I'm, I feel like I'm about to have my mind blown. Um, well, he is an American. Don't get me wrong. He definitely makes his, uh, his mark in America here. Um, and he does gain American citizenship. He didn't go totally. through. And he even testifies before Congress, as right. we're going to get to shortly. Yeah. Wait, what? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Houdini was a pretty fantastic uh, human being here, so... Uh, I got obsessed with him in, like, third grade. I think we read a book about him in the library class, uh, which uh, my librarian was uh, Elizabeth Warren, and uh, she read it to us. And it was a very weird thing because I got obsessed with magic at an early age and then wound up settling for comedy. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which is more esteemed. But um, as we're moving on here, uh, Weiss claims uh, Appleton is his hometown, like we said, but unfortunately they don't, they don't last very long over there. Rabbi Weiss... Uh, is unable to find work after moving the family to Milwaukee. Um, the key when you're a Jewish rabbi looking for, um, you know... Your next gig? Yeah, is to have uh, Jewish people in the town you're moving to. All right, that so, helps. Yeah, it definitely helps. But um, unfortunately, the family's in dire straits now. And, um, you know, young Houdini, still known as uh, Eric back then, or they start calling him Ari, okay, which sounds a little bit like uh, Ari. Right. What does that kind of sound like? It could be anglicized into it. You gonna make me say it, <laughs> Henry? <laughs> so, you know, it's like it's like all you Italian guys. You're all named Tony. You know what I mean? That's kind of how it works. So, but uh, yeah, at, uh, at just um, this is interesting here to me because uh, now uh, his father, Rabbi Vice, takes Ari with him to New York City. They're gonna go live in Manhattan. They wind up living in a boarding house on East 79th Street. The idea is that Rabbi Vice is gonna go ahead and get a day job and secure an, a living that he can then send for the rest of the family. But he brings young Ari with him. Now, while he's in Manhattan, uh, young Ari gets bit by a radioactive spider, giving him the superpowers to fight his nemesis, Dr. Octagon. <laughs> We're just looking to see if Kahuna, Kahuna goes... See if, see if Kahuna's still listening. <laughs> Something's not right here. <laughs> so, yeah. Not quite, but actually just I as impressive. I don't know what that thought... Look at that face. I mean, it's uh, either deep thought or uh, he's constipated. It's disgust. Yeah. He's mean mugging me right now, but... Uh, <laughs> 
So uh, just as impressive, actually. He's not Spider-Man, but he just as impressively. He, uh, young Airy debuts at age nine as a trapeze artist. This kid's got balls. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Man, they're probably well shown in that tight little trapeze outfit. But um, I mean, that's saying it lightly. Like, look at Harry Houdini's career. Like, some of the shit he pulled off was just ridiculous. No, some of the nothing. stuff I found, too, is that, all right, he's a young kid, and at that particular point in time, he's got to go out and find work. So rather than doing uh, yeah. heavy physical labor, well, maybe I'll go into that entertainment business. Uh, you know, there's no heavy lifting. <laughs> I'm Harry Houdini. <laughs> Welcome to Jackass. <laughs> you know, if you look at it in a certain light, he was the first Jackass. Down, 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 down. There's, uh, there's also another first that we're going to get into here that you're going to enjoy, I think, Cahoons. Um, See, so at age nine years old, he, uh, he goes ahead and he's uh, debuting as a trapeze artist. Mr. C, not ripping on you. How tall are you? Five six. Five six. Okay, you are an inch taller than Harry Houdini. So, uh, Coons, how are we doing on the mic with Mr. C? Does he need to lean into it a little bit? Or? Yeah, he needs to lean okay. in. Sorry, I'm bit. sorry. No, no don't worry sorry. about it. I just want you to be. Uh, you know, I, I want people to hear you. You're a smart man, a handsome man, a five foot six man. <laughs> <laughs> now, Go on, Houdini. <laughs> <laughs> you have his attention. Yeah. Now, uh, Houdini. A burger man. Yeah, Houdini, five foot five. By the way. All right. So, at five foot eight, I always felt like kind of a short guy, especially when I stand next to your uh, your handsome son. All mm. right. Again, Kahuna, do we feel threatened? We're the only two guys in this room in a room full of DILFs right now. <laughs> All right? Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. And, and the only two with hair. That's, a, <laughs> that's, that's right. And, and the last the, time you were at the optometrist? <laughs> that's a, <laughs> the hair's magnificent. But uh, no, it's a, we're, actually somebody called me um, uh, Portly Thomas Jefferson the other day <laughs> in the comments section on YouTube. Oh. I was kidding. It was my pal Mark Riccadonna. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, no, it was. Uh, it's interesting because he uh, he's five foot five, but he's a tremendous athlete. Okay, much like you, Mr. C. But he had a uh, he had a very uh, a gymnast physique almost. Hell yeah! Like born with it. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. could see him as a little kid. Well, maybe around. coming from Hungary, that uh, that explains a lot of things <laughs> too with the whole gymnast physique. I mean, they're putting out. All the Olympic uh, gold medal winners, right? It's true. It's uh, and um, not for nothing too. He has uh, the the trapeze artist body, like you're saying, Mister C. Five foot five. The dude's shredded. Big, big shoulders. Which actually, for some of his escapes that he became known for later, he would puff up his shoulders mm -hmm. in order to get a little bit extra, like an inch or two in space. Here, it's cool. He was actually also. I found this one out. Uh, he was bow legged. So when, when uh, there's a guy at work that always says, "You bow legged bastard," but he's kind of dumb, so I don't think he knows what it means. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so he was bow-legged, which meant that uh, his legs obviously bowed out rather than went straight, which meant that he could manipulate his height. So sometimes when he was being suspended from something, he could gain an extra inch on his height depending on how he manipulated his body. This dude was a contortionist, okay? Incredible stuff. Right. There's still video on YouTube of some of his wildest escapes. But uh, total athlete, too. He actually legitimately swam in a movie against the, the currents of uh, the Niagara Falls. Literally, that was like a, a movie stunt that he did where he had to rescue a woman from a canoe who was about to go over the falls, and all he had on him was a safety line. It was just him out there. No, There's no mechanical you know, shark or anything like that. He's not <laughs> jet skiing. There's nothing. There's no submerged you know, swimmers holding him up or anything. This guy was just out there swimming the Niagara Falls. Mm -hmm. But, um, again, he's a grift, uh, very gifted cross-country runner, and he could hold his breath for up to four minutes at a time. Kahuna, for the audience at home, I'm okay. going to ask that you hold your breath for the next four minutes. Okay. Now, that loud thud you're about to hear, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> <laughs> is going to be the Kahuna's head hitting the ones and twos, abruptly ending the transmission. <laughs> but uh, around this time, uh, a young... Now, not for nothing, uh, Aunt, what were you doing around... <laughs> Uh, Ming, we're going to need a new sound here. Uh, you didn't quite listening. make four minutes. <laughs> That's great. Uh, and what were you doing around like age nine? Actually, let, better yet, Mr. C, what was Andy doing? <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. That he knows about. Yeah. <laughs> Hot Wheels and G.I. Joe, I think. Okay. Both of which have uh, have played into his life here. Um, that's a good thing, man. Now, you know what uh, our boy uh, Ari gets into? He gets obsessed with uh, magic at age nine. He reads a uh, biography of a famous French illusionist who becomes his idol. The guy's name is Jean Eugene Robert Houdin. Dad, who was uh, Houdin? Uh, Robert Houdin was a uh, um, a European that 
got into magic, if you will, but he really started out, I think, as a uh, studying to be a doctor, and then he wanted to become a, a watchmaker. Really brilliant guy, but he's credited with being the uh, the father of uh, of magic, if you will, because he took it from like a street peddler, um, you know, uh, low end um, entertainment to uh, high end type of stuff, where he was now performing in theaters and was credited with uh, really performing his shows, if you will, in this theater um, genre in tuxedo that he was really playing to the elite, to the, uh, to the, to the big time kind of a thing. And um, again, he uh, really sparked something with uh, young Harry. Um, well, he didn't take on the Harry Houdini name yet, but... Um, He's really the father of, of magic, uh, if you will. That he was like the one of the founding fathers that a lot of people look to as the the start of taking it off the streets and into into a theater production. Well, so at age nine, uh, Harry becomes uh, or I'm still, I'm still airy at this time. Let's be honest. Yeah, he becomes obsessed with this guy uh, Houdin, if you will. So, uh, did you have an idol at age nine, Mister C? Somebody you looked up to? I did. I I was into Houdini. Really? Yeah. This Love is perfect it. then. I think I was around nine or ten, and I talked my mother into taking me to Mecca Magic in uh, on South Harrison Street in East Orange. No shit. Which was a premier. I mean, all the, the professional magicians went there from New York. Yeah, and if you went down the street to Orange, they could make your wallet disappear yeah, as well no, as no, your no, tires. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a different world in <laughs> late 60s. It was still, still safe, but it was a. Uh, I was. Totally enthralled with the place. That's Got my awesome. first book on Houdini, around 10 years old. It was interesting. He's a cool guy. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm happy to have it. So when we miss something that you guys want us to make sure we hit, because we did some research, but we're not subject matter experts like you, sir. So jump in on anything here, all right? Sure. Now, that being said, and at age nine, uh, we didn't know each other yet. We met in high school. At age nine, Houdini is obsessed with magic. At age nine, I am obsessed with Ghostbusters, um, G.I. Joe, and uh, L. McPherson. All right? That started young. Mom had the Sports Illustrated workout tapes. <laughs> right, right. And mom would you work out. I remember mom used to brag to her friends. She'd, they'd be like, oh, uh, Sandy, when do you find time to work out with two kids in the house? Or whatever. And she goes, oh, I just I do the L. McPherson Sports Illustrated workout tape, and Kevin just sits there and just watches the TV. <laughs> That's right. And my, my obsession with blonde Australians has never gone away. So we have some listeners in Australia now. So if you are a blonde woman from Australia... Please direct message me. This is important. <laughs> I'm offering citizenship. So, so, but That's great. Anyway, um, he gets obsessed with this stuff. He actually winds up studying um, magic under this guy named uh, Joseph Rin, who becomes super important to him. But around this time, Airy goes ahead and turns to Henry, partly due to the similar sound in his name, and also because uh, another magician that uh, Harry looked up to was this guy, Harry Keller, who was uh, another very well-known magician. Now, he mistakenly... Our boy Harry thought that adding an I to the end of a word meant like in French. So if uh, if you wanted to be um, uh, if you want seancey uh, like, we would just be like seancey would be the yeah, thing for the French. Another yeah, yeah. seancey. So, yeah, a lot, lot of vowels, a <laughs> lot of vowels. Right. But um, so he goes and he adds an I, thinking it means Houdini like. It does not. Okay, so, Houdin like. Yeah, Houdin like. I should right. say. So he became Houdini. Right. So, which is hilarious because um, as we get to, his brother then becomes the great Hardeen. So it's yeah, right. how many spins on this fucking name can you have? Yeah. <laughs> I think it was interesting, too, that um, the guy that he idolized, this Robert, was actually Robert <clears throat> Houdin. And um, Robert Houdin is a hyphenated last name. But when, he, when Houdin got married, he actually took the hyphenated name of his wife's last name. So he married a Houdin. And then hyphenated his own. So in other words, instead of the modern day times where the woman might hyphenate her name with her with her husband, this guy just did the reverse. He hyphenated his wife's last name. So he was R Robert and then hyphenated Robert Houdin. Uh, the French, very progressive. Very progressive, <laughs> even way back when. Now, if you marry a Houdin and she's the mayor of Whoville, then you have to <laughs> be contractually obligated right. to carry on the lineage. Absolutely. Um, I thought this was interesting, too. So he, uh, he takes the, the Houdin name and the uh, Henry name, okay? 
And uh, it's pretty interesting here. As a teenager, he's studying magic under this guy who's the paranormal skeptic, Joseph Wren. Joseph Wren is a very important figure to Harry. They, be, they stay lifelong friends, okay? And he's known as the mentor. Um, the skeptic part plays a huge, huge part, which is what we're going to talk about today mostly. Uh, in There's a lot of people at the time that are trying to portray themselves as maybe uh, a part of the occult. We've talked about it on other episodes before, the spiritualist movement, Dad, that uh, people are really big on this. Because anytime there's a massive war, there's this unresolved grief because people die and you have unresolved issues you want to say goodbye. So the idea that you could contact a loved one from beyond the grave, very appealing. Right. All right. And you can get these people with these sensibilities that are willing to pay top dollar for a sense of closure. And Houdini hated this shit. He was not a fan of it. And I feel like it got it drilled into him by Rin that magic is supposed to be about illusion, not deception. Okay. Which is a fine line to a degree. But there's that idea that also comes back to, like you said, with Houdin of are we street peddlers just pulling cards out of our ears or are we showmen? You know what I mean? Doing right. something honorable. Entertainers. Enter- okay. Inspiring wonder. So, well, he, he also hated them because he used to deceive yeah. people in that way. Correct. Yeah, at the start of his career. So Which he, we're, uh, he kind of knew that, that it was a joke. Am I getting ahead? Sorry. No, no, you're not getting ahead at all. Okay. We are right on the money. So. Okay. Right. Yeah, and his, his guilt from doing that is really what drove his hatred or dislike for people that were uh, deceiving. Because he started out, can anyone do card tricks in here? You do a card trick. When I was nine. <laughs> <laughs> when I was nine, I could have swear you. I had don't have he's going to take another trip to the magic shop yeah, that's before right. he can really pull it off. Well, my Uncle Paul, who's been a guest on the show, he can do a couple of card tricks too. But um, it was uh, card tricks fascinated me as a kid. But Houdini did start off in the world of, quote, professional magic, as uh, the Seances have illuminated us on, in uh, 1891, but he found very little success. He started off doing these sleight-of-hand card tricks, but he was recognized by his peers as a competent he knew what he was doing but he was nothing special he lacked the the finesse for it now th- there's another part with the deception you were talking about, mr c is there anything more on that we need to hit um as far as uh his uh, uh he feeling guilty afterwards of Absolutely. deceiving yeah, people yeah. yeah no no i i don't he, remember I anything else his own self-image then he was, didn't want to be known as a charlatan and he's, he's right that he's well i mean he got to a point where he was making enough money where he could look back at himself again. Right. I, I mean, he didn't have to beg, borrow, and steal, and cheat, and lie anymore. So he said, wait, what am I doing? Why did I do that? You know? But it wasn't until he got successful right. that he was able to look at himself and make that judgment call. He does not have a pot to piss in at this time. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, when you're on the balls of your ass, you're, you're going to do what you got to do to to make the money, and that's why he deceived people. It's very true. Sometimes you're not making money in your chosen career, so you start a podcast with your dad. <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah, they... Uh, Give that you a... speak like you're making money. <laughs> <laughs> Don't kid yourself, man. It's, uh, Bro, knows make money. See where it it's, goes. it's through excavation. <laughs> and, uh, again, the good firehouses of New Jersey need comedy shows on Saturday nights. I'm your man. But, uh, <laughs> Houdini would then turn his attention towards uh, escape acts. This kind of became his thing because he, he realized he was okay at the card thing, but he, you know, he didn't want to be known for that. And uh, the other guys are giving him shit, you know. It's like when I started doing comedy, I thought I was going to be a voices guy. I was like, yeah, I, I, could do a, I could do an impression of Christopher Walken. And you get out there and you're like, oh, everyone does Christopher Walken. Okay, so there's nothing special about me at all. <laughs> then I started diving into the writing side, and that's where I started to figure out my stuff. It's a killer Chris- Christopher Walken, though. Yeah. It's a, well, my impression was I couldn't do his voice, but I could shove a gold watch up my ass on stage. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, he got into, uh, of course, where do you have to go if you're a performer and some sort of a, a chiseler and a cheapskate back then? New York. Uh, and Harry, you're living in New York City. Yeah. Right. Coney Island. Coney Island. <laughs> oh, there you go. So uh, Harry and his brother, Theodore, a.k.a. Dash, who would become the uh, the great Hardeen, okay? Uh, he's, a, he's a fascinating guy, man. Uh, he actually has an appearance uh, on Boardwalk Empire, if you remember, one of our favorite shows. But um, So Dash and uh, Harry are now performing in Coney Island together and uh, as the Brothers Houdini, okay? And uh, on Harry's deathbed, this is how close the two of them were. I thought this was cool. On Harry's deathbed, he actually leaves all of his files, his secrets, and all the future allusions to his brother, with the instructions that on his own deathbed, all these files are to be destroyed. And almost all of them were burned in his furnace before his brother passed away. So yeah, I have, might have a little something on that a little there later. Was, yeah, uh, I was there's say. some notes. <laughs> yeah. There's some notes. Yeah. Yep. Now, um, now, I don't understand exactly what it is, but uh, 
magicians get hot chicks, man. They do. Let's be honest. David Copperfield got Claudia Schiffer. <laughs> okay. I've never, and magicians just seem to have good looking women. Or they, Is this a, where you're announcing your career change, Ken? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I'm going to. <laughs> um, Take your magic show to Australia? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if, uh, if any of you ladies out there, listen to me, okay? I'm five foot eight, blonde hair, blue eyes, good jeans. <laughs> My head's huge, but there's that. You know, it's a big brain. So, um, no, but what winds up happening is that uh, he actually, uh, Dash starts courting, the brother, mind you, Dash starts courting a uh, young performer. Uh, a lot of the performers were uh, German or Eastern European at this time. This is a big migration of the Eastern Europeans coming over. So um, in New York, it's, you don't have the full influx of the Italians coming in just yet. There's some, right? But it's a lot of Irish, a lot of, uh, a lot of German, a lot of English, all right, uh, some Dutch people still. And then there's uh, Wilhelmina Beatrice Rodner. <laughs> Wilhelmina. <laughs> Who, uh, you have to say it angrily. That's the, the pronunciation. It ensure, literally, it ends with an exclamation mark after every so, okay. um, Who, thankfully, uh, went by the nickname Bess. So, uh, unfortunately for Dash, Bess is more interested in Harry, uh, and the two begin a courtship, resulting in marriage within a year. Mr. C, how long did you know Mrs. C before you guys got hitched? Six years. Six years, damn. They were high school sweethearts. Yeah. Really? I mm -hmm. uh, kind of remember that now, yeah. actually. You were right. married 35 years. No and my shit. mother still hasn't thrown them out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, now, I know your whole story with Mel. We covered on another episode. You actually slept in your wife's bed before you met her, which is very awkward. Yes. So, <laughs> kind of beautiful on that one, too. <laughs> it makes me think, too. Whose beds have I slept in that I might marry one day? There you go. That's uh, And she was a blonde. There's hope for you. <laughs> <laughs> Oddly, I slept in your bed once, too. Aunt. That's weird, too. So, I remember. I was there. Yep, yep. And I snored so loudly that you left. Uh, yep. Drove drove the man right out of his yep. own bed. Very, very awkward morning on that one. That's okay. great. So, but um, anyhow, uh, they go ahead. Uh, the two of them hit this off. They are soulmates, these two. Okay? I uh, I happen to know the Cianci family. Where I, 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 aunt, I love you and your wife, man. I love Mr. and Mrs. C. And my parents get along really great, man. Um, so I, I'm, I get very happy when I see couples that get along, legitimately. It makes me think this shit can work. Uh, two peas in a pod, Bess and Harry. These guys love each other. So um, Bess yeah, actually... She, would, she also fit. I mean, she was a very tiny woman. She was only like five foot one, so... Yeah, he could throw her around a little bit. <laughs> right, right. <That's> right. right. <laughs> oh, you mean on stage? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, the, the other trapeze. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> da, na, na, na. Well, uh, Bess becomes Harry's onstage assistant for the duration of his career, actually, yeah. uh, and is one of his most trusted. But they, they, these two loved each other. We get to that, that kind of beautiful love story here at the end. But uh, Harry's very talented with these escape acts. He's showing great promise as a performer. But like you said, Mr. C, dude's still not making money. So these struggles began to ease slightly when he impressed his soon-to-be manager and longtime friend, a guy by the name of Martin Beck, okay? And uh, Beck becomes his manager and his lifelong friend, like we said. He's able to get Houdini on tour at the top vaudeville houses in the nation. Mr. C, off the top of your head, I'm just going to ask you real quick. Do you, what do you know about vaudeville? Vaudeville was the... Into the microphone, goddammit. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got a coffee he's cup He's good, problems. man. He's good. <laughs> he keeps giving me this. Yeah, because oh, he's, he's oh, yeah. Oh, okay, Leave him cool. alone, would so you? Let, right, let Kahuna right. work the ones and twos. And Larry, is he yelling at You want the food? Yeah. <laughs> let me hold my breath again for four minutes. No, I'm going to start rustling papers here just to come back. <laughs> this is, uh, guys, I, I'm very excited to announce my new project, um, the K.P. Burke Show, starring <laughs> none of these. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. I just want to make sure you had a lot of good info. I I want to make sure the audience can hear it, okay? Yes, sir. I don't want to get shitty uh, remarks no, from Timothy Matthew all. Rich, who complains about our audio levels all the all time. Right. I'm taking vaudeville. It was a variety show. <laughs> 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 Earlier on, it was it was the variety show of early theater. Uh, it, it included multiple types of acts, like uh, magician, strongman, burlesque, a bunch of different types that you can Three go Stooges. into. Singers, Three Stooges, Singers, yeah. Yeah. Muppets. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, we had a, there was an incident the other day, because uh, I used to perform in order to do stand-up when you first start. Now you have to do some very weird gigs. So we used to perform uh, at a burlesque show in between the burlesque dancers. And um, there were two of them who were really, really cute that I used to like to hang out with and talk to. And then there was one guy who was really into burlesque. And um, it was... It was kind of a panic move to see just how many articles of clothing he was going to remove. And you just hope that you went up before he was performing so you could leave. <laughs> so, but Avert your it's, eyes. It's, it's you... burlesque. They're very progressive. <laughs> so, 
Um, but yeah, uh, someone dropped a dollar bill in the front row of my show the other night, and I just realized I was like, oh, we are strippers in a way, aren't we? <laughs> um, so vaudeville is taking off here. Um, I mean, that was the form of entertainment. entertainment exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there tours. Was, there's no TV. There's no movie theaters. Uh, so that's it. I mean, if you want to, you have to go to a live show in order to be entertained. Now, vaudeville was very common around this time. Absolutely. Like, was it so? Like, was it? Kind of like accessible entertainment, like where like oh me, let's go to the movies kind of deal. Like was it like yeah? Actually, the like, movies is what ruined vaudeville. No, well, yeah. that I figured, but yeah, I mean yeah. like like it like it wasn't like too expensive for like an average yeah, like Joe a Friday to go night. out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. exactly what you would do. You'd go yeah, to the it, theater. It, it brought entertainment to the mm-hmm. masses, kind of a thing that the, yeah. the common guy, the the working man, could still afford to go out to a, a vaudeville uh, variety mm-hmm. show. Yep. And they were traveling like carny type people. Right. So you'd go you'd all over the, the place. Circuit. You'd make Small the circuit. You'd make the circuit. Smell like cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Martin Beck was uh, very influential in uh, Houdini's career in that he owned a lot of the theaters. He was a booking agent, and uh, uh, you know these guys. He saw Houdini's act and realized that this guy's got potential. He's got prospects and. Uh, Hooked, hooked him in, and, and I think his first job with uh, Beck was a, a sixty dollar gig um, in Omaha. So I mean, there you go. You're you're in Middle America. That's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for a manager to see me on stage and just say, "This kid's coming on his own tits." Joke is taking him places. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry for anybody who's oh, listening that no. was caught off guard by the vulgarity of that. Um, don't come see me live. Yeah, I mean, Houdini at the time was performing in a beer hall when Beck first saw him. So, I mean, that kind of gives Again, you an idea parallel. of the, kind of the, kind of the uh, gigs that Houdini was able to book for himself. And uh, Bess is with him right now. So, he's she is her, his stage partner. So, the two of them are going out. And he was really, uh, Houdini was really kind of a genius in, in the way he promoted himself because there was a lot of other magicians throughout vaudeville but he was always able to ramp it up to the next level, to the next level, and bring a fresh face to the whole thing. And More power to his wife, by the way. Like, can you imagine being his assistant and have, especially being married to the dude and watching him do all these crazy ass stunts? Yeah. yeah oh absolutely. my God. Well, who says she wasn't a nut job? Really? <laughs> well played. She was too. You're, well you're, played. You're taking it for granted that she's normal. She's normal. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, honey, what do we have coming up tomorrow? Oh, yeah, I'm burying you alive. Uh, <laughs> you're sure it's paid up, right? <laughs> so though he's a uh, very popular, good reference, by the way, Kahuna, that deserves more credit. Um, <laughs> though he was popular on the circuit as the uh, handcuffed king, Harry was still unable to, quote, lock down a living. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, I wrote this on cold medicine. <laughs> <laughs> While debating taking a day job. There's I, no I excuse for that not, one. I shit you not, the day job he almost took was at a lock company. Okay, not a joke. <laughs> Harry sets off to England, and this this part kind of gave me goosebumps. He this was for cool. A while worked for a locksmith. Mm-hmm. It, it's uh, well, they were saying that it was it was a kind of a crossroads in his career, right? Because what he winds up doing. Tell me where I'm wrong, but uh, you're wrong. He sets off, <laughs> <laughs> he sets off to England with fifty dollars in his pocket and no bookings to his name. Okay, so he's going abroad to try to make it here. Is that checking out with you, Mister? Yeah, he wasn't making it. I I always think of these stray cats. Uh, Band from England, they weren't <laughs> making it at all in the clubs. They come to America, say, "Let's take a shot." America went crazy and loved them, so they had to come here to get successful. Just like Piers Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I th- Houdini did the same thing. He said, "You know, it's not working out here. Let's let's go abroad and try it." And he hit. Well, it was really cool too because what he does is that he uh, he starts getting this kind of ballsier move. He actually uh, impresses the Scotland Yard officials. So Scotland Yard, if you don't know, that's like the preeminent uh, law enforcement agency in London. And um, uh, is it London or is it all of uh, England? It's all of England. Okay. It's, it's pretty much their FBI, if yeah. you will. Now, if you grew up on Disney movies like I do, uh, 101 Dalmatians would make you think that Scotland Yard is an all-dog police department. It is not. <laughs> so found out the hard way. But uh, That's the fire department. That's <laughs> <laughs> no, wrong movie. Uh, <laughs> <that's great. laughs> it works either way. Don't yeah. worry about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, you can't have an all dog fire department. That one of them's going to just start biting the stream of water coming out of the hose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. They're yeah. all freaked out by that. Um, you know, loud noises frighten my dog. But um, now he's real big on these handcuff escapes. So he actually starts challenging the Scotland Yard officials, and he'll just, "You put the cuffs on me, I'll pop right out of them." 
That's how ballsy this guy is. Little five foot five Jewish kid, you know, coming over from America. And um, his British manager, a guy by the name of Harry Day, which is um, what a generic name that is, um, Houdini's finally booked at the famous Alhambra Theater on the West End of London. Houdini left the coppers absolutely dumbfounded, and the audience is thrilled as he seemed to escape with ease from the most modern devices of constraint. His first show is a smash hit. It was immediately renewed for six months with a salary raise of $300 a week. Wow. I currently will work for $300 a week. <laughs> yeah, and that's so, back then. Yeah, just shy, by the way, if you adjust for inflation. Uh, I don't know if you guys would take this gig, but uh, that's $9,000 a week in 2019 money. Jesus. So not bad, right? Yeah. Just just short of what Kahuna is being paid now. Yeah. So, yeah. With, um, with the uh, day, end of the year bonus, he'll probably be there. But <laughs> End of the year bonus. It's uh, nine thousand dollars a week. What are we, a teacher in New Jersey? Um, oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> um, the success in London led to uh, more tour dates in Europe. I thought this was the coolest part of his story so far. Um, Houdini challenged the police to cuff him in the Netherlands, France, Germany, and even Russia. Now, if you have uh, if you have a guy who's into handcuffs, uh, women, be nervous. Okay, all right, just be be <laughs> right. nervous, be hesitant. Okay. Um, <laughs> But before all these stunts, Houdini was stripped and searched in order to legitimize his efforts. Houdini even sued a French police officer who claimed that Houdini bribed the cops guarding him. Houdini not only wins the lawsuit, but did so by opening the judge's own personal safe to prove that he had the goods, man. Now, Houdini was pretty funny because why ruin a good illusion? He later revealed in one of his own books and writings that uh, the judge actually just forgot to lock the safe. <laughs> That's amazing. And Houdini's Good like, test. ha! <laughs> <laughs> From across the room, channeling his energies. But uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. So he wins that lawsuit and then uh, busts into the judge's own personal safe. That's how you know you're doing good here. This one's the wildest so far. And Houdini does some wild shit. So for this one to stand out, it's got to be pretty good. Are you guys familiar with the gulag? Yes. Yeah. The Gulag A prison in Siberia, which is um, oh. one of the nastiest places on planet Earth to yeah, be. Yeah, you don't want to spend any time there. Yes. Uh, now, now, they made it look so much fun in the last Muppet movie. That's a... Damn. <laughs> is that how you know what the Gulag is? I know. I'm just fucking <laughs> It would be hilarious if there was actually a Gulag uh, in the Muppet movie, because it's just I just picture Fonz and Karma! <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what about the Gulag? So, uh, yeah, the Gulag is out in Siberia. Okay, and um, it's a tough place to be. Siberia is uh, so nasty that that's where Russians send people when they're bad. So, and Russia, not exactly the nicest place on earth either. Although we have listeners in Russia, so praise Putin. Um, (laughs) That being said, uh, Houdini escapes from a Siberian prison transit van. The van left from Moscow, and had Houdini not been able to free himself, he would have been forced to travel to Siberia where the only key that could open his locks was kept. All right, that's how wild this shit is. If you want to know how bad that drive is, by the way, Ant, because uh, you're a pretty fast driver. If we got in your, uh, you got some cool cars over the years we've driven in. And um, I attempted to see how long it would take us, because you once told me that you could drive from Daytona Beach to Wayne, New Jersey, in I think it was 10 hours. No, not 10 Probably 11. I wanted to figure out what the what the actual time it would take to drive that would be, and then the Anthony Cianci time. And uh, it is such a harsh drive, Google Maps will not allow you to determine how far that drive is. So that's funny. It's that undesirable. Glad you're telling me now. Yeah. (laughs) I I did get pulled over in Georgia with the cruise control set to 95. Oh, that's brilliant. (laughs) (laughs) And he said, you know how fast you were going? Yes, the cruise control (laughs) was working. Don't worry. Looks like those Seance boys are in a heap of hot water now. (laughs) That's right. Uh, Houdini. Talk to the gulag for you. Here's uh, here's the crazy part. So he's starting to get uh, more and more famous. Okay. And uh, Houdini's making some good money right now. Uh, he's starting to think everything's on the up and up. So while in France, Houdini arranges for an interview with the widow of his hero, Jean Eugene Robert Houdin. Okay, Houdin. Houdin. Uh, well, uh, Houdin. Houdin. Uh, they're French, man. I vote Houdin. That's a. <laughs> I vote. <Houdin. laughs> well, he'd hoped to gain permission to visit the grave of his hero, and he wrote that uh, he was not well received by the widow, and was not granted permission to visit the grave. So he does so anyhow but later writes an article in his own magazine disparaging the widow and then later on becomes uh, hell-bent on ruining the reputation of his former idol. So at age nine, Mr. Bill Cianci becomes obsessed with Houdini. 
Now imagine you get into magic after that, and then you spend the, after you finally start to hit and you got some success, you then turn all of your attention to smearing Houdini's name. Ron bastard. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was a bitter guy. He was actually, by the way, all of the descriptions of him, they say he's the most affable, kind-hearted man. And Because when you look at old pictures of him, he's got some spooky-ass eyes. I think he had a giant ego, too. Big, big ego. Well, I mean, why wouldn't he? If he's, You have to believe in yourself well, a little he was, bit if you're going to do some kinda, shit. He was kind of the Elvis of the, and the Beatles of the time. Oh, okay. Good point. He, he was that big. I mean, you could see pictures oh, of he him. Oh, he was, yeah, international. Doing, doing an escape in New York City or something, hanging upside down, and he literally cannot walk in the street. There's just thousands and thousands of people come out. Well, when your name becomes, because my favorite, my hero as a kid was MacGyver. So the, the, when your name becomes a pronoun, verb, an adjective, it can be used <laughs> interchangeably and everyone understands what you mean. That's what pulling a Houdini was, or hey, he did eat that shit. Oh, we got a Houdini on our hands. Everybody knows exactly what you mean. It's, yep. it's associated with wonder. So that's a great point. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, he takes his, uh, you know, does not get well received in France like he wants to with the widow, no. but he does take his newfound wealth and returns to America, a hero to his family. So this poor Jewish family that was, you know, pretty much had to leave Milwaukee to live in a tenement square of sorts. Um, he comes back home, purchases a brownstone in a neighborhood known as Harlem. Now, I don't know if you guys know much about New York real estate, but to purchase a brownstone in Manhattan for $25,000, that's pretty good, Cones. All right, that's called a win. <laughs> and uh, while in Europe, Houdini had also purchased a dress that was said to have been made for Queen Victoria. And we talked about how close he was with his mother. He adored his mother. Uh, he arranged for a large formal gathering of friends and family and presented his mother in the dress made for the queen to all in attendance. Houdini has written saying that this was the happiest day of his life. Mom, I made it. All right, that's kind of a cool moment. So if I ever make it, I'll do something nice for mom too. Well, we're still waiting, Kev. But like, no. pay, pay back some of the money I owe you guys. <laughs> That'd be a start. Move out. <laughs> you <know>. Start. <laughs> I had a house once. <laughs> uh, now, uh, after this, Houdini was essentially a made man. Okay, like you said, Mr. C, stunts are attracting huge following. His name's becoming a, uh, synonymous with, like, these crazy escapes and spectacles. Houdini was uh, very clear, like we said, though, to never attach his name to any sort of abilities gifted him from the beyond. So, like we said, Houdini, very skeptical of this stuff. Um, now, there's a... Uh, there's some weird stuff going on here. Houdini actually hates the frauds like we talked about and doesn't like the hoaxes. And while he was serving as the president of the Society of American, Magi uh, a Society of American Magicians, also known as SAM. So Sam's Club, Kahini. Uh, wow, I'm uh, screwing up. Kahini? Kahini? Kahini. Yeah. Kahini. I'm, Kahini. I'm okay That's with this. I'm not name. mad, though. <laughs> like, I'm not mad. Yeah, Kahini. Kahini. It's uh, the Martini. <laughs> That's a, yeah. a Kahuna-like by Ed and the Eye on the other side. <laughs> That's great. LP with shit. That's a showstopper oh, shit. right there. That was great. <laughs> um, so he has uh, he has this group called the Society of American Magicians, and from 1917 until his death in 1926, which, by the way, in this time frame, Houdini also performs for the troops during the Great War. Okay, kind of a cool thing. But uh, under his leadership, this group grows in size and credibility on a national level. Like you guys said, let's separate ourselves from this nonsense here. We're not the street peddlers. We don't want to be deceiving people. He gets angry about this stuff. Now, I'm going to throw to you here in a second, uh, Mr. C, because uh, you had a little bit of research for us on, mm. I believe, a, a group of gentlemen, uh, two gentlemen, uh, that small group Houdini was not a fan of, uh, no. that he helped uh, expose um, maybe some, some fraudulent ways. A little bit. Uh, uh, guys by the name of the Dunlap brothers, what were they all about? Davenport. Davenport, there it is, Dunlap yeah. brothers. Wait, I'm all over the place. No, no, you're buying tires, I think, rather yeah. than... <laughs> You know what it is? Uh, it's just the Yankees lost last night, and I'm not happy. I haven't slept much. I'm starting to confuse Harry Houdini with our next episode, H.H. H. Holmes. So unless Houdini starts murdering women in the second half of the story, mm -hmm. I think I need to separate this. <laughs> so talk to us about the Davenport brothers, uh, please, yes. good sir. William and Ira, they were around in the uh, middle and later uh, 19th century. They had, uh, uh, well, I, you know, it's like we said before, after the war, after the Civil War, people are looking to connect with their old. So, so the whole spiritualism thing started to gain popularity, and then uh, kind of uh, the the late 19th century industrialized America was uh, 
uh, family sizes actually got a, a lot smaller. So the, the value on fate for people and as well as children, you know, there was, it, it, was, it, was, uh, it, it was held closer to heart. And uh, in come these two brothers that are promising people that they can connect with their old ones. And, um, and they made a lot of money on it. They, uh, they would uh, have themselves tied, turn off the lights in a room, and uh, musical instruments would fly around, and they'd, they'd play, and then the lights would come back on, and they'd still be tied up. So this was a, a, a target for Houdini in the early part, and uh, later um, in his career. Actually, no, it was uh, around, 19, around Civil War time, I think he exposed them. Larry? Uh, well, the whole spiritual movement started before the Civil War. There, were, sisters, there were two sisters right? yeah. that really were the credited with being the uh, the founders of the whole spiritual movement, and they proved later on to be, you know, charlatans oh, yes. that they were they were bogus. They were yeah. um, talking to or communicating with the dead by uh, clicks and, and bumps and stuff. Or <laughs> that's what we got going on. The, raps they were called the rap, yeah, rap. Yeah. and it turned out that they were able to uh, actually crack their toe knuckles under the table to give the rapping sound. But anyhow, we're this the whole Davenport sh- brothers and we're here to say, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk to your deceased relatives in an old school. <laughs> there, you there you go. But uh, the, the whole trauma and death and, you know, a loss of loved ones during the civil war gave a huge rise mm. in spiritualism that who wouldn't want to be able to talk to their deceased, uh, their deceased kin. And now we're, as you said, uh, in the industrial part of the uh, late 19th century and, uh, you know, um, early childhood disease has taken kids out. So you might have eight kids born into a family, but only three survive childhood kind of a thing. So and it, it's, it's hard times. It's hard times. And um, the more death and destruction that you have in your own life, the more I think reason you're going to have to want to try to communicate with the with the deceased. So, um, but then these guys, these two guys, come along and uh, you know, they're, they're it's a cool trick, a, by the way, to have the music well, playing while they're still yeah. kind of tied up. That that one would trip me out a little bit. <laughs> they started out, I think, with their hearts in the right place. Their their father was a New York City cop, and he was heavy into the occult, and uh, the whole family kind of started uh, doing sessions. I think they called them. And uh, and the boys uh, uh, eventually went public with it, right? And uh, so it went. But they originally they did they were believers, but I guess they found they could actually make money. They can make more people mm-hmm. believe by yeah having some some bogus Shysters. And then we we talked about it in previous episodes with Mary Todd Lincoln and all the uh, all the death that uh, was with her that you know she was one of the credited to be the one of the first to have a seance going on within the white house kind of a thing so it, it's a it's a huge uptick in in popularity if you will and now you got these people like these brothers uh performing uh they're making money on this deal that they're they're taking it more um as a money-making scheme than they are to bring uh, relief or or solace to uh to the to the living, you know, yeah, that it, it's a on. weird thing because the other side of this coin is that um, yes, you are extorting these people in a way because you're you're giving them fraudulent information. You're not actually contacting their deceased relatives, but what those people are buying is peace of mind. It's very, it's a complicated thing. I have a friend who works at a comedy club that will occasionally have these mediums come by during like a Sunday afternoon. They'll do a show, and it's almost always somebody who lost somebody tragically. And this is a kind of a way for them to feel a little bit more at ease with it. So it, it's really, it's a dicey road. But I totally understand and respect Houdini. By the way, a modern continuation of Houdini calling out the frauds like this is done by Penn and Teller, one of the, the two of the, probably yeah. the most interesting magic group of all time. Right. right? Yeah. Um, one thing I thought was cool here, too, uh, was there anything else on uh, on those those evil brothers from Buffalo? Um, you know, that's what I'm, I thought I did have something. Well, tell you, if you come up with it, uh, just just tap me on the shoulder here. In the meantime, I want to talk about another person that uh, Houdini exposed. Um, who's the first Ghostbuster, Kahuna? The first Ghostbuster? Yes. You're going to go with Venkman, Egon, Bill Ray. Ray. Who are you going with? I would say 
I would say Ray. I would say Ray is putting a lot of thought into this. I respect that. The first, <laughs> the first Ghostbuster is Harry Houdini. What are you talking about? That's what his his reputation as a Ghostbuster now is that he's sitting there and he's shitting on these people who are fraudulent <laughs> mediums. Uh, okay. So get this: one of the most famous ones that he uh, discredits is this woman named uh, Mina Crandon. Okay, now this chick's wild. Um, she claimed that she was uh, able to channel her dead brother. Okay. And uh, she was actually convinced, the people were convinced, there's a, a Scientific American is a magazine that my father pointed out is still around today. I didn't realize there were magazines outside of Maxim. So um, <laughs> this is all new information for me. Welcome but, to the world. Man. Yeah, but apparently this magazine. All well, other porn has yeah. gone to the internet. So. <clears throat> well, this uh, magazine of sorts uh, was offering a cash prize to anybody who could actually prove paranormal ability. They were very excited by this. So this woman, Mina Crandon, is a very promising candidate for this. Now, Houdini was hilarious because he would often go to seances disguised, wearing a disguise so people couldn't tell it was Houdini, uh, and he would show up with a reporter and a police officer to prove that these were frauds. Uh, that's actually something that he did testify in front of Congress for, right, Dad? Right, what, absolutely. What was the actual reason he was there? Well, uh, Congress was uh, called him in for um, testimony, if you will, on all these different various bogus seances, and uh, they were attempting to write a bill to protect people against these uh, charlatans, and Harry was called in for, um, you know, professional testimony in support of this bill to protect the people. People so, are getting ripped off. I mean, it, yeah, it's it's nasty. You you're, want you're some sort of integrity to, in this to business. attend this seance, only to be, uh, you know, it's all smoke and mirrors. So now uh, in comes Mina Crandon, who's about to collect a uh, pretty sizable cash prize from Scientific American. But on the board of people that have to approve and, and kind of, you know, make her genuine uh, is one Harry Houdini. So Houdini's investigating her, and within minutes of seeing her little act, by the way, because here's what she would do if we're around a uh, poker table, because Ming doesn't have a, Ming has a, a, an official podcast table made by Ernie O'Donnell from Clerks in the <laughs> other room. And then in this, this room that we use all the time is a poker table from Price Club. So... Um, <laughs> If we were to all lower the lights in here, guys, and light a candle in the center of the room, and we all held hands right now, we'd be Kahuna's holding... out. <laughs> we'd be holding a seance. Now, let's say Kahuna was Mina Crandon in this instance. Oh, okay. Damn. And, uh, and we're all holding hands, right? And Kahuna goes, I'm going to contact uh, one of your dead relatives. Uh, give me a name. And if, uh, you know, let's say we're going to contact the name um, uh, Evangelista, okay? Just because I don't think anyone here has an Evangelist in their family. And um, an Evangelista, if you are here, uh, please let your presence be known. And then what Kahuna would do is he would reach his foot out. There'd be a bell in the center of the table, right? And we'd all see the bell. And then Kahuna would reach his leg out underneath the table and then tap a second bell underneath the table. And we'd be like, holy shit, Kahuna's talking to Aunt Evangelista right now. <laughs> this is wild. So Houdini sees this and goes, uh, oh, cool. That's very cool, Mina. Can you do that? Uh, I want you to wear this device that's going to mobilize your legs. Just do it again, okay? Just do it again. That's really cool. And now she can't reproduce the results. So they then agree to another test where she's going to be put in a box, okay? So they put her in this weird box kind of a thing, and she's got like a like, like cabinet doors around her face or whatever. And then uh, the idea is that she's going to be able to summon these uh, beings, if you will, and talk to them through the, you know, being a psychic medium. Uh, and what she does now is uh, she's able to produce the results again. And Houdini's like, oh, all right, so maybe I was wrong here. Maybe it's not just this. What's the deal? And everybody who's trying to credit this Mina Crandon woman are like, see, Houdini, you got it wrong. Houdini opens up the little cabinet doors on her face, if you will, which, let's just be honest, that's a hilarious thing to open up cabinet doors <laughs> in someone's face is there. Hey, and, uh, Baba Louis, all right, yeah. all right. Get back in the box. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, they open up these cabinet doors, and uh, Chick's got a collapsible ruler in there with her. And what she's doing is opening the thing up with her neck and then tapping the bell with the ruler. Oh, my God. Yeah, so she's a fraud. And guess what she does? This is when you know you're a true fraud. You accuse your accuser of being a fraud. She goes, no, Houdini planted that there. He's nervous about my power. So lifelong feud for that. Crandon went on. She was mostly discredited. They said she had absolutely no genuine ability. But uh, she continued to perform for people who were... Literally marks. That's what it wound up being. Yeah, through through this time, too, Houdini is um, fighting off lawsuits in the millions of dollars where all these, you know, he's telling these people that they're, you're a fraud, you're a fraud, and they're filing suit against him and everything else. But he's he's never really found uh, 
uh, at fault that uh, he's proven correct in, in all of these uh, various cases that uh, he was accusing the mm. uh, the phonies. Well, one of the biggest losses we're going to get to in a second here, because you have a awesome jersey tie-in for this episode, LP. I'm very do excited. About it. Okay. You do. Um, we'll, see. we'll see what happens. It's a good one. It's a good one. But real quick, I don't want us to, because I, I was so fascinated by the debunking of the psychics, because that's not something I ever got into with Houdini. So we are going to talk about his death, which is definitely what qualifies him as a loser. Um, and that, that I don't mean a loser is a, a, in esteem. I mean circumstance. Um, but I do want to cover a couple of his really cool, um, his biggest escapes. Mr. C, off the top of your head, what's your favorite big Houdini escape? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is always the torture cell. Hell yeah. Hanging the Chinese down. water torture yeah. Or as it would be called now, the Eastern Hemisphere water torture cell. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> so. Yeah. And the handcuffs, of course. I, uh, you know, because you. When I was a kid, I think the first book I had was Houdini on Magic, and and um, uh, one of the chapters spoke of how not only did he uh, uh, work out all his muscles, but he he worked out his his stomach and his throat as well, and he could regurgitate lock picks that he swallowed. <laughs> so this this was again when I was a kid and reading this, it's it's amazing. Yeah, I mean. Going back to when he was in in England, I think that's the way he was able to escape from Scotland Yard. Yeah. That they did the full body search on him, and I mean, he full well, body he was, search. Well, he was he was naked for most of those right. escapes. That, where where is he hiding the key? Well, he yeah. was able to you know. <laughs> cavity search. No, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the other thing was, uh, uh, we spoke about his um, physique before, but he would also I don't know if he did curls or what, but he would puff up his forearms before they put the cuffs on him. Just to give him a little more wiggle room. Genius. Yeah. Genius. Body yeah. manipulation, man. That is... Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It's nuts. He's got a couple of really cool ones here. Um, now, just to prove that he was legit, uh, you guys are all handy guys in here, all right? Uh, Ant has helped me fix my car before. Mr. C, I've seen some of your contraptions. Some of <laughs> very talented, too, with a lot of the railroad stuff and everything. Yeah. Um, and then LP... Uh, I mean, your 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 shop of horror, if you will. It, it's <laughs> it's impressive some of the shit I've seen you come up with, man. Um, but uh, guys like you would be issued a challenge by Houdini. He would say, "Make a contraption that I can, you know, that you think I can't break out of." And he would almost always break out of it. It was pretty fantastic. Um, this one's one of my favorite. It's known as the mirror stunt, but ignore the word mirror. The mirror is just the yes. newspaper that. Um, this is my cover. favorite, even though you asked my father and not me. You want to? Oh, uh, tell us about <laughs> no, it. If you, if you know it, tell us. <laughs> about it. I know a little bit about it. So the mirror cuffs is the. Uh, it's the first time that really they thought they stumped Houdini, right? It was in London. Correct. They put him on it, stage. Ignore the word mirror. The mirror is just the paper yeah. that's reporting well, on the incident. Yeah, it does, but it also kind of gives a little homage to the cuffs because they were perfectly kind of symmetrical in uh, as they looked. Uh, but yeah, it mirror? was the. They were. I give it to you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it was. It took five years to create these things from a blacksmith. Mm -hmm. is what I read. And uh, it was from Birmingham. For yeah. all your pinky blind as fast. <laughs> <I think. laughs> and uh, pinky, or you're leaving, leaving out the uh... pinky. <laughs> what do you have against vowels today? <laughs> it's Birmingham. They don't have vowels. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it took him five years to make it, so they gave it to him, he went up on stage, and it took him hours, five hours, six, a, a bunch of time, and uh, they put him behind, like, a black curtain to, uh, to, so he would escape, and he came out from the curtain uh, once or twice. The first time he came out, he asked to take him off or something, and, <laughs> yeah. they, and they refused to take him off, because, like, then you're going to know how his, they work. He wanted to take his jacket off. His jacket off, yeah, and they said, no, then you'll see how the contraption works, because if you just look at these cuffs closed, you would have no idea how, how they would operate. They looked much different than standard uh, handcuffs. And at first, if I remember, too, he before he even did the mirror cuff, he said, no, 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 I claimed that I could only get out of police cuffs. I never said anything about it. And then he finally took on the challenge. Uh, and he struggled with it, so they, they said, no, you can't take your jacket off, so you have to go back behind the black curtain. Uh, and then he came back out again, in which Bess met him. And that's where I think a lot of the controversy lays, is people think to this day that she might have slipped him a key. Because shortly after she saw him, I think like an hour, under an hour later, he was able to get out of them. Yeah. Uh, and it's a huge... Popped yeah. a, a lock... Uh, 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 yeah, now I can't talk. <laughs> she <laughs> popped a, a lock pick in his mouth like a Tic Tac and... That was it, yeah. puked it up a little so later. To this day, that they don't know. And I think there's two cuffs to today that are the original. So there's Correct. the ones they originally made, and then that same blacksmith made another like pair. duplicate cop. Yeah, and those are the only two that exist yeah. today. Well, that was he, part of his um, come on, too, his promotion, is that he would challenge anybody 
um, with a bonus of a hundred dollars, if you could, you know, if you could provide the handcuffs that I can't get out of, I'll pay you a hundred dollars, kind of a thing. Yeah. That's that's big time money back then. Yeah. That uh, you know, he went from town to town, and one of his big draws too, even back in the in the vaudeville days, is that, you know, the vaudeville there was a lot of different magicians, and and uh, Houdini would come up with a, a trick, if you will, an illusion. And then other people would duplicate it, but he would always be able to one up it, and he would make it fresh by whatever town he was in. They're traveling from town to town, so in one town he's going to escape from the trunk, uh, all handcuffed. In the next town he's going to escape from um, a big uh, barrel or keg of beer. In the next town he's going to be doing the same the same type of trick, but now it's it's in a milk uh, milk container and That's all a, this yep. kind of stuff. That's so, another one of the big ones. And it, it, you haven't seen Harry Houdini on television, so you know yeah. there's there's not the giveaway of oh I've seen this before on TV. Every town that he goes to is the first time that they've seen him. So, uh, but he can always keep it fresh with something new and and another level of uh, difficulty. By now I'm going to be in this trunk in handcuffs with chains around the trunk and everything else. And he's still able to uh, make the escape. Yeah, getting dropped in a crate, locked up. Locked inside a crate that's also locked, getting dropped into the Hudson River, then popping back up and swimming along in the Hudson River. Probably the most dangerous part of that whole stunt, to be honest. Um, yeah. And then when they found the crate, the locks were still in the crate. That That's how good he was. He popped out of the locks in there. There was no gimmicks or anything like that. Pretty cool stuff. Um, quick, quick note for the kahuna here, because we're at the hour mark right now, so we're going to start to to wrap up and decline here. Mm-hmm. I want to throw... Wrap up and decline? I, I want to... Uh, <laughs> Damn. I want to go ahead and I want to make sure that we throw to you for a Kahuna's casting couch at the very end here. But I want to keep in mind that this gentleman is five foot five, so please okay. keep that because I have a I have a contrarian point for the casting couch today. One thing that you left out in it that I thought was uh, worth noting, he asks out of those cuffs in the whole Birmingham thing because he wants to have his jacket removed, and then they say no, like you said, because they can't take the contraption off. So he then takes out a pen knife, puts it in his mouth, and cuts his own jacket off his whole body. <laughs> I think that's what was more impressive than the cuffs. <clears throat> and then the other thing was that they said that Bess may have either uh, slipped him the key or the a lock pick of some sort. But the key was six inches long. Yeah. So unless Bess was quite the woman, um, <laughs> I don't think she'd be able to pass a six-inch key to Houdini through a quick kiss on stage like they had. But um, they did say that this was uh, – Houdini was – when he finally freed himself of the complex cups, he actually wept because he was being carried onto the streets on the shoulders of a cheering crowd, and it was probably the most difficult thing that he had done his entire career. Um, the milk can escape. He would lock himself inside of a sealed milk can filled with water on stage. The stunt was advertised as, you want to talk about getting some, some butts in the seats, failure means death. Right. Yeah. That is the stunt that Houdini is most associated with. Uh, as Mr. C mentioned, the Chinese water torture cell. Hanging by his feet, Houdini would be lowered, locked in place, into a glass box with bars, and it would then be filled with water. All right, Houdini would escape the torture cell to the amazement of the crowd almost every night. That was a regular thing for him. Okay. Um, Dad, you ever been in a straitjacket? Uh, no. Not, not what's, it, what's it not, like, Kev? It's a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I'm actually doing this entire show. Uh, it's a, it's an audio medium, so you guys don't know. I'm wearing a straight jacket right now. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but uh, tell us about your time at the sanitarium. It's uh, well, uh, Dad says I'm an excellent driver. I only get to drive on Sundays. Kmart sucks. Uh, <laughs> Houdini routinely would hang himself in a straight jacket upside down from tall buildings or on a construction crane, and then use his small frame to pick the locks on his jacket free himself, and then get lowered down to a cheering crowd. This guy was money. All right? He knew what he was doing here. So, Yeah, and I, th- I think, too, you're talking about putting uh, um, seat butts in the seats, too. He would go and the local, he would challenge the locals, and there would always be some commercial or some industrial kind of a thing that, all right, but we're going to provide the beer that you're going to be lowered into. Or the milk, or the whatever, the container. Great promotion that, for the business. Right, so, it was. so, so, so you, uh, you got a you got a built-in. All right, you got a yeah. built-in promoter right there. That's <laughs> um, also getting getting some advertising out of the thing and making sure that they're going to fill the theater. Great advertisement for everyone except the locksmith. Um, yeah. Now the the wildest stunt that he did was his buried alive stunt. You know anything about this, Mr. C? I I, I remember he did it. He he really. Uh, 
got covered over there. I think he was naked there as well. Yep, six feet deep. Yep. Um, yep. He wasn't in a coffin. And it was no it, the hardest thing for him after he got out of the handcuffs was climbing up out of the dirt. I'm pretty sure he, yeah, he, nearly he almost suffocated. bought it yeah. at one time. The first time he just got his hand through to the top and then kind of collapsed after that. And once they realized his hand went limp, his assistants had to dig him out the rest of the way. He almost died. Yep. In his own personal diary, he goes, this is the most dangerous stunt I've ever done. So, because he's a smart guy, he only did it two more times. How often, um, <laughs> how often did Houdini botch stuff? Like, I know, like, there was, like, it wasn't often. But, like, like is there, he would, were there he any fake famous? A botch. Yeah, sometimes he would fake a botch in order to make it look like the crowd's, right. oh, Houdini's finally, he was the showman of showmen. Right. Okay, pretty cool here. I mean, if you're going to oh, witness the humanity. Houdini. A, death, a death-defying oh, act, he's and alive. the guy, you know, Fakes almost dying. I mean, that's just going to bring more seats in. Well, maybe tomorrow night he's going to buy it. <laughs> yeah. So to tune in, you know, next time on you know, Houdini. But <laughs> um, real quick, I do want to get to. Uh, we have to cover the death of Houdini shortly. But in the debunking of spiritualists, um, he actually it cost him a famous friendship. LP with our New Jersey connection. Can we, do you have anything oh, on the? Uh, yeah, you have something yeah, else on those yeah. brothers? Um, the it, New. I don't know where you're going with the New Jersey connection. Oh, our New Jersey connection. Pretty exciting stuff here. Very famous man. Uh, Not a New Jersey man, but very well-known man. Mm. Very famous author. Uh, We're on on the same page now? Yeah. All right. I've been Uh, waiting. Oh, I'm excited. I was going to blurt it out. Thank God I didn't. (laughs) Well, uh, LP's got a a New Jersey connection here for us, and this one's not shoehorned in. This is pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah, this is pretty straightforward. So who's the famous friend that uh, is going to have a hard time with Houdini after this? Well, there's a very well-known spiritualist um, by the name of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who was the author of the uh, Sherlock Holmes novels and everything else. World-famous guy, world-famous author. Um, But he is a, if you want to call it a a devout spiritualist. He's a firm believer in the whole um, spiritualism. Um, Oftentimes it's miscredited that he really kind of went over that line when uh, his own son was killed. But he was a spiritualist long before his son's death. Now, you got to remember, too, that he's he's an Englishman. England is involved with the First World War big time now. So, again, we have a, a situation in history where a lot of people are dying, just as we had in this country with the Civil War. Now we have over in Europe um, and later America – with a, a lot of people dying, a lot of people wanting to, um, you know, speak with their, their dead relatives. But um, um, Sir Arthur Conan, Conan Doyle and uh, Harry Houdini are friends. They're buddies right now, although Houdini is the anti-spiritualist. He's doing everything he can to debunk these people. Um, but Sir Arthur um, invites him to come to... Uh, Atlantic City. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is on a world tour right now, and he's in America. He invites um, Houdini to come to Atlantic City, and um, Sir Arthur's wife is there as well. So the three of them are in this hotel room in Atlantic City. Go New Jersey. All right, so there's our our firm New Jersey tie-in. And They stayed at the Trump Taj Mahal, I believe. Is that correct? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Houdini really wants to believe in this. I mean, he, I think part of his search for this uh, or his, his driving force of debunking these people that he really wanted to believe in, in this whole being able to speak with the dead. But uh, well, he missed his mother very much. Yeah, his, his mother is gone and he's really uh, a mama's boy, if you will, that he really wants to speak with his with his uh, his late mom. Room full of mama's boys in here, by the way. <laughs> so, I mean, Houdini later writes, I was willing to believe and even wanted to believe, um, and with beating heart I waited, hoping that I might feel once more the presence of my beloved mother. The, um, the Doyles go into this seance, and it's really led by Mrs. Doyle, all right? So she's the medium, if you will, and she's trying to... Um, call up um, Houdini's mom and she slips into a trance her eyes are fluttering and there's a pile of papers on the table in front of her and all of a sudden um, 
uh, there's like 15 sheets of paper that that starts with thank God, thank God. At last I'm through, the scrolled message began in perfect English. So Mrs. Doyle in this trance-like state is now writing on these papers as if she's communicating with um, the dead Mrs. Who, uh, Mama, Mama Houdini. Uh, <laughs> there you go. There. Cue, the, cue the spooky music. And it went on for 15 more pages before she comes out of this spell. The spell is broken. And at the conclusion of this, uh, Houdini doesn't really say anything, but he just takes the top sheet. Now, you got 15 pages of what was written. Um, and it's again, it begins with thank God, thank God, at last time through. Um, this is the way this whole message starts. Houdini gathers up all the papers and writes a like a handwritten note on the top page. It doesn't say anything to the Doyles and just kind of leaves. And it wasn't until like six months later that Houdini now goes public with what he had written. Well, now that the Doyles think they're like, finally, we got Houdini on the right. side. The right? Doyles now think, wow, he, you know, he didn't say anything. He must be like totally a firm believer in this whole spiritualist because now – you know, she was just able to conjure up the dead mother and, and then wrote, six months later, wrote for 15 mm -hmm. pages. Showman. And now um, six months later, uh, Harry finally makes uh, public what he had written that afternoon at the Ambassador Hotel in Atlantic City. And he, he says, uh, my sainted mother could not write English and spoke broken English. So you know, this whole thing is, is debunked because... If she was going to um, write anything, it was probably going to be in Yiddish, um, you know, her own native her own native language, and certainly not English, and not perfect English as it was written on that paper. So, with that, uh, there was a complete <laughs> separation. Mm -hmm. So ended the friendship between Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and, and Harry Houdini. Yep. So you know, that, it's, that it was the end. Of a little earlier than that too. I think they started having the falling out because. Doyle was a, a big supporter of Mina Grandin. Very much so. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. An yeah. outspoken yep. advocate, yes. Yeah. So this was kind of a, let's mend fences, right, guys? And then they're like, oh, or sever ties forever. Yeah, so. and, and Doyle was not only a believer in the whole spiritualist thing, but he was like a leader of a whole spiritualist yeah. group over in England kind of a thing. So well, he, he was, was a he yeah, was a And he believed in the, the fairies. I think I remember that. There was a, a famous yes. photo, right? Yeah, there was a... Uh, I remember, right. It was a trick photography God. that had created these tiny images of these uh, fairies. Where the it looked like they, you know, uh, and, and fairies, you know, um, different different... Connotations depending on what you're Is this where we about. bring in the Irish oppression? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Bathroom break. Okay. Yeah, that was, uh, no, my uh, my ex girlfriend from Ireland told me all about the fairy people over there, which we think fairies are nice. In Ireland, fairies, very, very mean. Okay. Uh, they're like, it's not a nice way to talk about the gays. Uh, <laughs> we almost made it through a whole episode without. <laughs> there you they're go. Very without litigious, insulting. Anthony. They're very litigious. Um, that being said, we have to. Uh, there's this one part of Houdini where they did say there was a hope and a promise that he had made to his wife that if he did die before her, that he would attempt to make every effort to contact her from beyond the grave. All right. Now, unfortunately, Houdini's going to die. OK, uh, people listening at home might be wondering, where is the loser part of this story? Well, this is one of the most famous men on Earth, and uh, it's not really a great way to die. Um, it's kind of a it's actually a terrible story, to be quite honest. Um, this guy's pretty wild. Uh, the loser angle of the episode comes in that at age 52, um, two college students visit Houdini one day. Houdini had broken his ankle a few days earlier and was resting in kind of a, a couch type, you know, uh, it's just a couch, right? A sofa, right. if you will. Mm -hmm. So he's sitting there in the sofa trying to rest his broken ankle, and these two college students come in. Uh, they're Canadian college students, right? And uh, again, students is a loose parlance, right? We're going to say, Dad? Yeah, I mean, when when you say college student, you have the image of uh, you know nineteen, twenty, twenty one year old. Uh, um, this one guy in particular was a thirty one year old. Um, you know, he's in, he's definitely an adult and been around. You know left, what I mean? left back a few times. I'm a TA. Yes. I keep telling you, I'm a TA, <laughs> not a student. Yeah. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so these two uh, students come in there and they ask Houdini uh, if he believes in the Bible. Uh, no, actually. There was, I think, three 
of these college students. There is, it got weird because they, they mentioned the names and then they, they don't introduce the third guy, but then they use his name later in the story. It was weird. The article I read wasn't good. Yeah. Um, well, the one guy in particular was J. Gordon Whitehead, and they gain entry to backstage to see Harry under false pretenses that they're returning a book or there was a stolen book. There was something involving a book that they were able to gain uh, entry to backstage to see Harry. And Harry would often make the claim that, you know, he could withstand anybody punching him into the stomach. Now, again, this guy is totally ripped from, from head to toe. And he would often take on that challenge that, yeah, go ahead, punch me in the stomach. You know, give me, give it your best shot. Well, these, these college kids, no, not kids, these college students come backstage. It's a couple of hockey enforcers from right. Canada. Now, <laughs> Harry's laying down on, a, on the couch, right, because he's got a, a busted ankle at this particular point. And he's really not feeling well either. I think he's got like 102 fever at the same time. But against uh, his doctor's wishes... You know, the show must go on. He is the ultimate showman that there was nothing that was going to stop the show from going on. So he's really kind of resting on the, on the couch so he's not putting pressure on the broken ankle that he's already got. Plus, he's got a fever. and um, He's got a fever. Yeah. <laughs> Nearly prescription. So they're... It's they more ask him, <laughs> <laughs> It only took the whole episode to pull the Christopher Walken out. Finally. Call back. <laughs> Um, they ask, uh, Mr. Houdini, is it true that you'll uh, withstand a punch in the stomach from, uh, from anybody? And Harry says yes. And with that, immediately, this guy Whitehead gives him like four or five quick shots. I mean, not quick shots, really violent blows to the stomach while he's lying down on the couch. So he had absolutely no time because typically he would prepare himself. You know, he brace yourself, he's standing up, brace yourself, quen- tighten up your, your abdomen uh, in order to take the shot. But, you know, he, this was totally like a, a sucker punch to the abdomen four or five times. And it's already suspected that he might have some abdominal issues because he wasn't feeling well and he's already got a, a fever. Um, so... Uh, you know, with that, I mean, <laughs> with that, the, the, the all uh, hell breaks loose kind of a thing. So he, he performs that night, as he, I recall. He still goes on and performs that right. night. Now, as a man who has uh, crutched his way with a broken ankle on stage downstairs at Gotham, I can tell you the audience is not comfortable with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. This guy's going to defy death and he's coming out hobbling. It's, yeah, it's like not a, a good thing. Broken ankle and he's looking weird and everything. He actually uh, performs... He gets told he needs immediate surgery and declines it, goes on to do the next uh, night's show. And then uh, he goes on to do a third show. He actually passes out on stage and has to be revived and then insists on finishing the show. So consummate performer here at the very end. If I pass out on stage, I'm probably not doing my closer. Um, But uh, so he goes ahead and um, he gets rushed to the hospital at this point. It's beyond his control. Yeah, now this is October 22nd. Correct. So uh, now they feel like he's going to recover. And uh, he's uh, he's getting worse as it goes. He's not very happy. He's kind of miserable. And um, the the story I had always been told as a kid is that he just got sucker punched in the stomach, and that that possibly ruptured his appendix. So he probably had appendicitis to begin with. All right. And uh, he winds up dying. Uh, what day does he die on, Larry Burke? Uh, October the thirty first. He dies on Halloween. Halloween. So, Trick or damn. treat. Yep. So cue the Halloween music. It's uh, uh, now with the weird thing too is uh, actually this Halloween I'm going to be in the woods uh, in South Carolina hunting, unfortunately, and um, I'm going to miss out on all the slutty Halloween costumes. It's the best part of the year. Blair I mean, Witch, little Blair Witch project. Yeah, that's uh, that's. Be, I'm I mean, so scared right now. <laughs> let's be honest, you're you're going to probably miss out on Slutty Joker, and that's about it. Uh, yeah, good point. Good point. It's uh, it's a weird year for that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, Houdini dies. Um, his last words are... Do you know his last words, Mr. C? I don't remember. That's it, actually. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you got that right. His Best? last words were... Oh, um, uh, yeah, go ahead. I am tired of fighting. Okay. So that's his last words. But he has a code word set up to contact his wife from beyond the grave. So Houdini dies on Halloween. Okay. Um, the uh, college students who roughed him up, uh, they actually get... Uh, in turn, also punched in the stomach and die. 
by Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> That's a little fan and fiction then, here at the end. <laughs> and then sit in Old Sparky. That's, a, <laughs> That's right, right. There you go. Yeah, no, Teddy Roosevelt, Old Sparky, not involved, unfortunately, in this story. It would be a better story if they were. Um, but, uh, yeah, they, uh, they rule it double indemnity. Uh, so his actual his insurance winds up paying him twice for that. Is that what I understood, Dad? Um, yeah, that, that initially when uh, Mrs. Houdini best tries to collect on the insurance, it's denied. Now, double indemnity means that well, you have life insurance. If you die, you're going to get paid. If you die in an, with an accident, um, like traffic accident or whatever, um, you're going to be paid twice. So that would definitely set her up for life with mm -hmm. the insurance policy that she had. And Houdini, again, one of the most popular performers in the entire world at this point. So. Initially, initially, she's denied the whole double indemnity uh, clause. Um, she hires a lawyer to go you know, to uh, appeal that. Um, the lawyer then um, gathers up testimony, affidavits from the three, you know, quote-unquote college students that um, delivered the, the punch to the stomach and was then later proved to be uh, righteous in that she does receive the double indemnity uh, on Harry's death. But they had a whole... Uh, pact, if you will, that if either one of them died first, um, they would try to contact one another from the dead. So again, this so I, is I want like to ask everybody what their code word is going to be, by the way, too. So Mr. C, if you had to contact Mrs. C from beyond the grave and you wanted her to know that it was legitimately you, outside of farting, what would, <laughs> <laughs> what you, would you do to smell let that her smell. know? You should, oh, that's same him. Bodily functions. <laughs> the whole group. I don't know. All right, I'm going to throw it around to everybody. Rosebud. So start the Rosebud. <laughs> Rosebud. <laughs> there a you Citizen go. Kane reference. Too smart for our audience, <laughs> sir. <laughs> and what would you do to let Mel know that it's you? If I'm being honest, and I feel like I have to be, boobs. 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 It's not poop. Uh, it is not him. poop. <laughs> it is him. It's him. And, uh, Larry Burke to contact mom from beyond the grave. What are you going to say? I, know, I guess I'm going to have to come up with something in, uh, in Armenian or something. I don't know, but. That's a, that's a tough one. You I'd wouldn't sing You Are So Beautiful, your wedding song? Why am I better at this <laughs> <Wow>. thing? Because <laughs> you know? you're you, Kev. How yeah, what can a, I say? Uh, Kahuna, you have to contact someone from beyond the grave. You've uh, passed uh, away. Some sort of Muppet, Muppet reference. <laughs> <laughs> I think they'll just know. Yeah, that's great. It's definitely Kahuna. Karma! <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for What's yours? For me, I don't have one. There's no one I'm going to contact from beyond the grave, guys. When I'd I like go, to know you're all right. When I go, I'm out. You made it to hell safely. <laughs> <laughs> it's warm uh, down here. Knock from the roof if you're up there. Knock from the floor if you're down there. Also true. That's uh, <laughs> But uh, in wrapping up here, uh, Bess holds a seance uh, every year for 10 years following Houdini's death. Okay, in an attempt to contact him. The code word that he has is Rosabelle Believe. Rosabelle was a favorite song of theirs, if I remember right. Stop, correct me when I'm wrong, Mr. C. You're no, here no. for, you're for the, the integrity of the show. <laughs> um, so Rosabelle Believe is going to be the code word that he's going to say to her to let her know that it's actually him. And for 10 years, they hold a seance for him. There's a, a lit candle in the center of the table. Some very famous mediums get brought in to try to come in. People that, you know, obviously Harry hadn't debunked, so... Kind of be hilarious that they brought Mina Cran. Oh, yeah, he's here and he says he's cheating on you in hell. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but LP, what do you got on that? No, I just that uh, you're right. I mean, for every for the f first 10 years after Harry's death, on uh, every Halloween, they would hold a, a seance. And then finally, on the uh, the 10th anniversary of his death, they had this candle lit during this seance trying to conjure up, you know, Harry and uh, have him. Speak from the dead, if you will, and uh, nothing happened. And she just got up and snuffed out the candle and said, "That's it, no man's do, worth." Do, do. <laughs> yeah. The number you have dialed eight seven seven. Poor English or Spanish. A, yeah, or like Netflix, we always make this joke every episode. Are you still summoning the dead? So, uh, there's, there's all kinds of Houdini followers and clubs that still. Yeah, to this day they have seances. Trying to absolutely, every Halloween. absolutely. I was yeah. I was trying to find it. Um, um, Out in L.A. they do it. They're real big on that. The, that's the, a shocker. The, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Yeah, there's uh, there's esteemed uh, Houdini followers. A lot of his uh, merchandise, not merchandise, but we'll say his, uh, we'll call them artifacts. That's what they really are. Uh, wound up in the possession of David Copperfield. Mm -hmm. Okay, other couple famous magicians. Um, the Houdini Files LP. I know we want to wrap up on that real quick because after 10 years, um, 
she realized that her husband was not going to come back and contact her. So she gave up on that. Now, there was one time when she said that uh, she actually said that she did contact him, but revealed that it was a fake, which kind of just ruins the legacy of the whole thing. So I don't want to end on that sour note here. But what do you have on the lost Houdini files, LP, to bring us home? Um, I don't know what files you're really speaking of, but I did The ones that were burned in the furnace. Um, Yeah, supposedly that upon Harry's death, all of his illusions or how to master his illusions and tricks or escape cabinets or whatever you might want to call it, whether it be given to his brother, because his brother was also a you know, pretty famous magician in his own right or illusionist in his own right, but Arguably never really... Arguably ballsier because he would do it... Uh, Houdini would perform behind a curtain some of the escapes, and then uh, Hardeen had discovered that the audience would go crazier if they could watch the struggle. Watch, watch his... Right, watch so him now he removes the curtain and he's just doing it right out there in the middle. So almost a more talented... Uh, possibly a more talented magician. Well, yeah, different talents in different ways, but um, Hardeen takes a lot of his stuff, continues to use it, and then upon Hardeen's death, it was supposed to be destroyed, and it wasn't. Um, and then some of that fell into the hands of a, a collector, if you will, that opened up this museum, which I thought was pretty spooky, opens up this Houdini Museum up in Niagara Falls, and it's a big uh, tourist attraction kind of a thing, and then there's a mysterious fire that inf- you know engulfs the whole place in, like in a very quickly the whole place goes up in flames and they had all kinds of catastrophes prior to that but that was the the end all that a lot of this harry houdini uh, memorabilia if you will or um devices went up in in flames and never from never more kind of a thing so it's a uh, it's kind of a crazy kind of kind of crazy way to go out there very mysterious fire very suspect fire took place up at niagara well, uh, our next guest for the next episode is uh, my very mean sister, Carrie, who in a minute is going to kick down the door and start <laughs> giving us all noogies and, uh, and punishing us. Um, so At least thanks said, for the heads up. Yeah, we're gonna, I'm just letting you know now. All right? I, hope you wore, I, will, I hope you wore breakable underwear. Um, so that being said, guys, we're going to wrap this episode up. This was a very, very fun one. Mr. C, you got something to take us home on, sir. Just two quick things. Hit me. I forgot something about the Davenport brothers. I remembered that Houdini did steal some of their techniques, like oiling his hands to get out of ropes and things like that. Ah. Just a quick little ditty. And lastly, I have a very weak, another Jersey uh, uh, tie-in. Talk to me. So this is a stretch, but I think it's okay. It might be valid. Houdini once uh, escaped from, uh, um, was a Washington, D.C., federal prison, cell number two. You know this? No, but I'm excited. (laughs) And... He escaped from that cell. That cell was uh, kind of famous because the former occupant was a gentleman named... Yes! Oh, yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. yes! Charles Guiteau. Guiteau. Charles right. J. What? Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Oh, right. And who was Charles Guiteau? Oh, my Charles God. Charles the assassin of President James A. Groff. Thank you so much. We completely <laughs> yeah, forgot I, about I that. For, I completely... I read that and I was like, oh, holy crap, and... We just got the reaction out of the game. Oh, my God. <laughs> Perfect. Let it be known Perfect. that KP yeah. literally stood up and cheered. <laughs> yeah. uh, my reaction. Because we totally oh forgot my it. Mr. God. C, you kept nice. us on us on this one. Well, so. That's yeah. great. Kev, I want to thank you for coming to my podcast. That's <laughs> <laughs> I no, found out something kind of cool, awesome. actually. The um, the Ambassador Hotel where uh, that In meeting Atlantic between... Yeah, yeah. It's technically still standing. It's the Tropicana. No Is that shit. right? Yeah, I've, I've wow. stayed in there. The, <laughs> the Tropicana, the, it was the Ambassador first, and the, it closed in the 70s, I, from what I read, and then uh, Tropicana bought it, and they used the framework of the original building to build upon that. Wow. So also, technically, it still stands. That's, that's interesting. Now, also, weird side note, inside the Tropicana is a, a nightclub, an 80s-themed nightclub, in which I tore my left ACL at a bachelor there party. There you go. <laughs> and the name of that nightclub? But yeah. Boogie Nights. <laughs> Boogie Nights. There so you go. I got to thank down, the Cianci boys for coming in. Mr. C coming in strong with the facts. Anthony, you're handsome. Um, <laughs> so I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Cianci's Burger Reviews online. Please check those out. Yes, yes. Larry Burke, have a great time over in uh, Pennsylvania with my mother. Um, Kahuna, thank you for everything you do here. Always. Guys, if you like the show... Please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. That's all we're asking right now. We're giving you as much content as we can for free right now. We got some pretty cool shit coming up down the line here. 
The show's taking off. I got to say thank you to a bunch of the people, the regulars, uh, Stu, Nick. Uh, you guys all know uh, uh, Jay Perro. I don't. I I, I, I want to thank these people, but we only know them by username sometimes. Uh, Miss uh, Rachel Veronica out in Texas helps us out a ton with the show, sharing it. Uh, I put the posts up every Tuesday on my Facebook account. It's KP Burke on there. Check me out there. It's where you're going to get the most out of me. Twitter and Instagram, uh, KP Burke sucks. And uh, also there's the American Loser podcast Instagram page where we are posting everything. If you subscribe to the show, you get these episodes early. That's how it works. All right, consider leaving us a review on iTunes. It really helps us out. A written review means more to us. That way we can keep track of it. We want to reward the people that are on the ground floor here with us. I'm sorry that the Yankees lost, okay? If you're not a Yankees fan, then I guess you're not feeling you know, the loss that we're all feeling today. I hope the Giants can do something, Dad. I need a win right now. <laughs> all right? Danny Dimes. But I think it's time. Let's go. I think it's time. But that being said, uh, Kerry is uh, lighting matches and throwing them in the hallway. <laughs> so is, that, gonna, is that gasoline? We're going to go ahead and let her in here shortly. That's what but, that uh, smell was. <laughs> but, guys, uh, thank you so much for listening to the show. Please uh, continue to enjoy our special Halloween uh, uh, abundance of episodes here. And uh, my name was KP Burke, and that was Harry Houdini, American Loser. An American Loser the day I was born. An American Loser the day I was born. An American Loser the day I was born.